red dot moving back and forth? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. So that the title of my talk is Electrodynamics of Exciton Plus Mon Interfaces, and I will talk about strong coupling and a little bit uh, more about the nonlinear properties of such materials and strong coupling, which becomes a pretty hot field nowadays. Now, this is my collaborative network. So it consists of a lot of uh, uh, guys doing really wonderful experiments. So for instance, Adi Solomon at bar -Ilan University in, in Israel, uh, we've been collaborating since 2010, I believe. Reno Valley is in Bordeaux. So he's doing uh, uh, awesome uh, experiments on molecular systems at plasmonic interfaces. Uh, 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 Matthew Felton and Hike uh, Arutunyan at Emory and the University of uh, Maryland at uh, Baltimore. Uh, we recently uh, going to publish, it was recently accepted, not a letters paper. I will talk about uh, second uh, harmonic generation at the strongly coupled systems. And Yen Wige is at UC Irvine. I also mentioned our work together. So uh, I uh, um, also collaborate with Yehim Prior at Weizmann. So he used to be a director of uh, chemical physics there, but now he's uh, uh, emeritus, but he's still very active. So he's in between theory and experiments, I would say. So also uh, there is a strong collaboration with uh, Lois Salamas and Andrei Piritansky. We recently uh, uploaded a paper on um, how gain medium could be used to enhance second harmonic and plasmonic systems. And Joseph Zies, Abe Nitsan, and um, most of the work, and I'm going to talk about numerical part, is done by uh, Elena Drobnik, my PhD student. So she, unfortunately, she's going to graduate really soon. It's usually the unfortunate part about very good PhD students. So uh, before we begin, I want to uh, mention quite a few cool things we are not going to talk about because I don't have ultimate time. Uh, uh, enough time for that. So these are uh, under umbrella of collective optical effects in molecular systems at plasmonic interfaces. Um, the experiments I'm going to mention are done by Renaud Valley in Bordeaux in France. So the first experiment he was considering was to have a thin layer of dye molecules deposited near a flat uh, gold mirror and measure the collective fluorescence decay rate as a function of the distance between the layer and the mirror. And he saw modulations of that rate as a function of uh, distance. And we explained that nicely. So one of these graphs corresponds to um, a collective decay of molecular systems uh, and superradiant states and whatnot. And another one is still sort of debatable. So this experiment that he done, and we did some simulations, is on what is called opal array. So this is basically self-assembled um, polyesterine spheres on the order of um, 300 nanometers in diameter. Then a thin layer of silver is deposited on top, forming the bumpy surface. And then on top of that, he deposits some um, uh, J aggregates, and he can control, quote unquote, control chemically control the density of such molecules and adjusting the uh, the density he saw, uh, in addition to Rabi splitting, which we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes, the third resonance, which was attributed to uh, superating state of molecular excitons. So these are the things we are not going to talk about, although they are very, very exciting. Um, so this is the outline. We'll uh, talk about the um, general idea of uh, plasmonics, metal nanostructures as a tool to control line. I'll show you a couple of um, examples, and most of these examples are obviously well known for those who work in plasmonics. Then we'll um, talk about the physical model I have for exciton plasmon material. So basically our main um, uh, computational tool that we use to uh, work with experimentalists. So the first step after we introduce the model, we'll talk about what we can do in the linear part of the simulations to expand uh, the two level systems, right? So we are going to introduce uh, raw vibrational wave packets and couple those to Maxwell's equations. We'll see a couple of really cool implications of that. So the major part of this talk is what we've done recently is a nonlinear optics at um, um, plasmon interfaces. And we'll talk about the second harmonic generation in systems comprised of nanoparticles and nanoparticles with uh, uh, molecular excitons. All right. so. Very quickly, uh, at the flat interface, if you are to consider uh, metal and dielectric, you can um, uh, analytically solve Maxwell's equations and you end up with a bunch of different electromagnetic modes 
Uh, the first type of moles is standard one called the Brewster mold. They propagate in all directions where the solid lines represent a real uh, K vector. So there is no spatial decay anywhere. Then you have localized surface plasma and polaritons that are just coupled states of matter and light. And they are decay in the, along the interface and propagate in this direction. And propagating surface plasma and polaritons are basically evanescent waves that stuck on the interface between dielectric and metal, depending on um, conditions of the dielectric constant. And then you can have the propagating waves going along the interface. So physically, this means actually that if we are to talk about surface plasmon, this is uh, evanescent waves stuck on the interface and the spatial localization is significantly smaller than the wavelength or let's say localized surface plasmon. I'll show you a couple of examples how the electromagnetic uh, uh, modes look like as a function of time and coordinates. So basically what you have is the electromagnetic mode that is highly spatially localized. So one can consider these types of systems as uh, nanoresonators. And then the ultimate goal is to use these type of systems to probe molecular systems and see what interesting things we can learn from that. So the first example is the standard example of a spherical nanoparticle. Let's say we consider a silver of um, a diameter of 50 nanometers. One can calculate uh, uh, scattering cross-section as a function of the wavelength, and you will see even though the size of the particle is insanely small, the resonance, pretty sharp one in this particular example, is around 400 nanometers or so, right? So now how, how does the field look like? So here what you're looking at is the plane wave that going from left to the right is vertically polarized. And this is the, bi this is the um, plane that bisects the particle. And um, we exciting that system at the resonance right over here, 380 something nanometers. So you can see the buildup of energy on the surface. You see also part of the light actually comes through. The reason is because the size of the particle is approximately the size of the skin layer. And there are lots of uh, things you can see. One of them is the fact that uh, these hot spots are pretty, pretty small. So on the order of tens of nanometers or even smaller than that. And you could have the local field enhancement on the order of 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth. That's the first example. Now, more often than not, well, experimentalists also work with the periodic array of holes or periodic array of particles. When you have periodic array of holes, like in this example, circular holes in, um, I believe this is silver as well. One can measure or calculate transmission and reflection of that system. And uh, as shown right over here is a function of frequency. You can see a bunch of resonances here. And this resonance relatively broad corresponds to the surface uh, plasmon polariton associated with uh, waves propagating along the surface. So one can also examine the local fields as well. So since this is a 3D, <clears throat> I decided to show you the dynamics of the field. Uh, that is on the output side of the structure, really close to one of the holes. So basically what you're going to see is the same picture as I showed you earlier with the uh, moving fields, but then the, uh, the, intent, the field comes at us and is polarized in this direction. So basically what you are doing, you're looking at the field from the other side of the structure. And, and here it comes. So the K vector is looking right at us and we are at the local field about maybe 10 nanometers below the surface on the output side. And you can clearly see again these hot spots and how they move and so on and so forth. Now, if you are to count seconds while watching that movie, one, two, three, each second corresponds to one femtosecond. So I adjusted the simulations enough so you could see how fast that uh, uh, oscillations are obviously that makes sense because the uh, frequency is on the order of 1.7, 1.8 uh, electron volts. All right. Having said that, one can also think about utilizing these properties of localized plasmon uh, modes to transfer the energy from one point to another. You can also um, realize that these properties strongly depend on polarization of the source as well. So in one of the works. Uh, quite a few years ago, we showed that one can control the propagation pathway of the uh, um, energy transfer from the point right over here to the point of uh, detector on top or on the bottom. So basically the energy goes either up or down, making this T-junction at a tiny small switch, so to speak. 
Uh, so there are lots of um, um, applications and these fields are looking uh, pretty cool. So what we wanna do is the following. So let's consider a very simple uh, optical resonator comprised of two metallic mirrors. And then inside the resonator, I have nothing, um, nothing that's right over here and the thin layer of uh, molecules. Let's say these molecules are just a bunch of two level systems. We'll talk more about the math describing that. But for a moment, assume we have that toolbox that allows us to simulate optical properties of such systems. So now what I wanna do, I want turn, to turn off emitters and calculate the spectrum. And then I will see very nice black line corresponding to the um, uh, fundamental mode of the resonator. It sees right over here at the frequency, uh, about 1.54 electron volts. Now I turn on my emitters back, and let's say the thickness on the order of 100 nanometers and the uh, density of emitters is about maybe 10 times of that uh, of uh, uh, dry air, uh, so not that dense. Uh, and depending on the density, you can see that uh, you observe two modes instead of one. So the physics of the two modes is relatively simple. You have the emitter, two level emitter, you have the cavity, and because of the coupling between them, the energy exchange, you have um, coupled oscillators and you have the hybridized states, right? So omega plus, omega minus are called um, upper polariton states, lower polaritonic states, and both of these states have the strong coupling if, uh, lambda, uh, if uh, um, delta here surpasses all the damping rates in the system correspond to uh, 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 hybrid states of matter and light. So this, these are uh, the states we are interested in and, and we uh, wanna learn how these states contribute to nonlinear properties of such systems. Okay, so uh, in terms of experimental uh, part of that, uh, you can think of, uh, let's say, periodic array of holes. And this experiment was done uh, by ID when she was a postdoc at Thomas Edison group uh, many years ago. So they did uh, uh, transmission through a periodic array of holes. And I think that was silver or maybe gold, I don't remember. I'm not, yeah, this is silver. So adjusting the periodicity or um, incident angle, you can see these resonances popping up. And then let's say you have a very good chemist in your group that can deposit J aggregates on top of this array. And if the absorption peak of the G aggregate system is pretty close to one of the plasmons peak, peaks, you see that splitting that we call Rabi splitting because of the strong coupling. So if you are to tune the in-plane wave vector, basically sweeping uh, plasmon resonance through the absorption peak of G aggregates, you recover that nice signature of strong coupling that it is avoided crossing. Okay. So now <clears throat> what we want to do, we want to uh, numerically simulate uh, such systems uh, for various geometries. And in order to build that approach, I have to make one very important statement. The statement is, so uh, in our model, we consider fields to be classical. So in Maxwell's equations, we trust, although we have some works where we uh, look at the quantum electrodynamics, but this is far beyond a uh, uh, particular uh, discussion for today. So I have electromagnetic fields, moving back and forth through the interfaces and whatnot. And where I have molecules at each point where a molecule is or atom is, I have a Schrodinger equation, right? Or Louisville equation with some damping, uh, uh, artificial damping that I put in. Then I calculate local um, quantum mechanical average dipole moment multiplied by the number density of emitters and I get macroscopic polarization. Um, and of course, the time derivative of that enters Ampere law right over here, and we solve this self-consistently. So this forms Maxwell's block equations, right? So one important statement before we begin is to uh, realize that uh, even two-level system in the near field is not actually a two-level system if you want to properly account for a local polarization. So this uh, picture illustrates that idea. So the blue color here corresponds to the local field that is vertically polarized. Now, if there is no uh, uh, interface here comprised of two slits, everything will be blue. So the plane wave just goes through and nothing happens. Now, when you do have interface, you have sharp corners and whatnot, uh, there is induced component of the field, local field and near field region uh, that's shown by red color. So you see the regions where you have blue and red at the same time. And of course they depend on where the point is. 
and what the time is. So you can have elliptical polarization and whatnot. In 3D, it's even more advanced because you have also a Z component of electric field induced. So you have to take that into account. And we do that. So simple to level emitter in three dimensions in reality is a four level system, right? So uh, ideally you will have sort of a S orbital and then PX, PZ, PY orbitals. You can also adjust uh, uh, transition dipoles properly and place these guys in, in every position of, of interest. Now for the lambda type uh, atoms or molecules, this is even more advanced because you have to take into account different M states. And we did that a couple of years ago. It's kind of tedious, but uh, it's possible to couple that properly to Maxwell's equations. So, all right, having said that, this is the basically uh, our model in nutshell. So we have plasmonic, plasmon sustaining materials. We solve Maxwell's equations where the current density in the linear regime corresponds to either Jude model or Lorentz model or more advanced if you couple these guys together, basically this corresponds to a phenomenological um, epsilon as a function of frequency where all these parameters are taken from the experiment. The um, molecular part at every point in grid space where we assume we have molecules or atoms or any emitters, we solve Louisville equation with appropriate um, <clears throat> damping we calculate macroscopic polarization, couple that back to electron dynamic part. And now uh, remember that there's a local electric field E here is actually taking from Maxwell's equations, which means that this uh, Louisville equation parametrically depends on where the molecule is. So we of course take into account the spatial variation of the field as well. So in summary, this part is every grid point occupied by quantum material is associated with the polarization density driven by local electric field. So in this ultimate case, we have mean field approximation, even though we have several ideas of how to expand that. So stay tuned, probably next year we'll have a couple of work, uh, papers published on how to go slightly beyond mean field. Now, uh, all grid point to grid point uh, uh, electromagnetic interactions are taken into account. So all molecules are basically coupled through the local, uh, through the uh, classical field. So the collective modes are taken into account uh, uh, directly. And uh, both linear and nonlinear optics for the molecular part is, uh, is considered. And we properly account for uh, three dimensions in arbitrary electromagnetic field polarization. Now, the goal today is to show that this uh, sort of standard approach nowadays in uh, 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 molecular plasmonics is expanded where we include the nonlinear response of conduction electrons in metal. So in order to do so, we follow a, a phenomenological uh, hydrodynamic model, which is written right over here. So this is basically a second law of Newton for the field uh, 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 velocity of conduction electrons. So this is the second law of Newton. This is the Lorentz force. And one can introduce also uh, the pressure, right? So then um, along with a continuity equation, you can write the equation on macroscopic polarization of your metal, uh, where you have nonlinear terms shown right over here in different colors. So if you drop all the nonlinearities, you recover the Drude model, right, of course, in linear portion. So we couple all of these equations together in, and then investigate what happens to, let's say, second harmonic generation when you have molecules present and whatnot. Okay, so uh, obviously this uh, numerically is, is, is quite tedious. So in order to simulate that stuff, we uh, uh, utilize a parallel processor. So this is our toy cluster at, uh, right here at ASU uh, that we built uh, by basically ordering motherboards in one part of country and, uh, and other things in the other and assembling it on site, saving quite a few dollars on that. Uh, these, we have FDR InfiniBand, and it's pretty fast, but not as fast as big guys at DOD, of course, at Air Force, where we have access to. So the typical number of emitters we're discussing and going to discuss in a couple of minutes varies between uh, 1 million and uh, 100 million. <clears throat> okay, so just to demonstrate how rich the physics of these type of systems could be, let's consider a relatively simple uh, geometry comprised of periodic array of slits, okay? Uh, with all the numbers shown here. And then on top of that system, I just put the thin layer of about 50 nanometers thick, uh, uh, two level systems, okay? So each 
uh, molecule here is resonant to a uh, standing plasmon mode of um, a very degree of slits. And what I want to do, I want to launch 100 femtosecond laser pulse, which is intense, such that it will um, allow emitters to go to the upper state and then go to the ground state. You have several rubber floppings. And the question is how the dynamics of that system looks like. So instead of showing you the fields, what I'm going to show you is just the zoom in of emitters. So the red line, uh, the red color here, this is the uh, these are a bunch of emitters, and of course you don't see them because there are so many of them, and one pixel is about maybe 10 emitters or so. Um, <clears throat> now the red color corresponds to all emitters in the ground state. Now when the these uh, numbers begin to change, so these are femtoseconds, and the laser pulse comes in. And what I want to see is the dynamics of how the emitters undergo transition to the excited state and back. So when colors inside that red band change to uh, blue or black, this means that emitters at this particular position undergo to the excited state and so on and so forth. Now, what you can anticipate is the following. So when the light comes in, now, because emitters are really close to these sharp corners, the local field enhancement of the sharp corner is right over here, approximately at these points, is significantly higher than here, which means that the emitters that are close to the sharp corners will go to the excited state earlier than these guys, and so on and so forth. So here dynamics comes. You don't see the field, but you're looking at the population of these guys. And that's exactly what I saw, right? What, what, what I just said a couple of minutes ago. So you see the excitation and uh, uh, completely inhomogeneous, and it depends on various positions and whatnot. And all of these guys are taken into account. And one important thing to realize is that uh, the refractive index of system, of course, changes uh, significantly. You can also see the uh, uh, group velocity of light, which is significantly smaller than speed of light and vacuum, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty rich, right? All right. So now uh, two level uh, approach is, 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 is good and, and people doing this kind of thing. So what can we learn uh, by adding extra degrees of freedom? So this is the work we've done a few years ago and we're currently working on expanding that uh, into the nonlinear regime. So the work done in collaboration with Eric Sharon from uh, University of Paris South in Orsay. So what we did was uh, to look at the Maxwell's equations again, but instead of doing Louisville equation, we decided to uh, include raw vibrational degrees of freedom. So basically, this is a phenomenological uh, uh, diatomic molecules, where in addition to the fact that the electron can jump between two electronic potential surfaces, uh, the um, nuclei can vibrate and the molecule itself can rotate as well. So the question is, what happens if you put these type of equations together with Maxwell's equations? and look at the strong coupling. So how the strong coupling and Rabi splitting changes? That's, that was the ultimate question. So here is the basically two level system, right? So you have a potential energy as a function of internuclear separation. This is your ground state. And depending on what the internuclear separation is, which we allow to change, of course, R depends on time, right? And then the excited state we consider either a dissociative state, so it's a continuum, or another bound state with a minimum slightly shifted. So it's bound, bound uh, transitions or bound continuum transitions. All right. So, and then we just placed these guys at the plasmonic interface, made this uh, um, transition resonant to the plasmon resonance, and examined the transmission spectra of that system. So, this is how the transmission spectra looks like where there are no molecules, a very broad resonance corresponding to the standing plasmon wave. Now, if I have only two level emitters with no revibrational degrees of freedom, I will see a small Rabi splitting, as we would expect to see, obviously. So now I turn on that revibrational degrees of freedom, and what I observe is really cool. So the green line shows bound bound transitions. So you still see the Rabi splitting, but you also see this kind of weird small resonances. If you examine the energy of these resonances, you realize that these are nothing but the frank quantum transitions from the ground state to the excited state, because uh, the um, equilibrium positions are slightly off. So you have the redistribution of the raw vibrational wave packet at the top, right? Now, if you have bound continuum transitions, so instead of red, we look at the continuum uh, 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 dissociative state. Uh, we don't have, um, of, of course, uh, 
uh, sharp uh, uh, resonances, but the Rabi splitting is pretty high. So you could also examine the dispersion with the photon energy and the in-plane K vector, and you see these very nice narrow resonances for this case C, where you have bound-bound transition. So these are Frank quantum uh, resonances uh, that you actually observe in a transmission spectra. Okay. All right. So now I come to the actual uh, ultimate uh, goal of my talk is to describe the recent advances in the nonlinear plasmonics uh, with uh, uh, <clears throat> hydrodynamic model included. And then uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, comparing with experiments. So all these tools are nice and, and cool. But we have to realize that physics is experimental science. So we want to make sure that our simulations actually lead to uh, real measurable things. All right. So before we begin, let me quickly show how hydrodynamic model um, uh, shows up in the nonlinear spectrum. So if you are to consider a periodic array of triangular poles like that, so this is the unit cell, and then pump the system at one of the plasmon resonances and the, the intensity is high enough to see the harmonics, the signal that you calculate corresponds to fundamental frequency. And then you can also see the second harmonic, you see the third harmonic, you see a tincture of the fourth one and so on and so forth. Now, since we're working in time domain, we can also pump the system with two colors as well to see whether we have any uh, four wave mixing or difference frequency and whatnot. And indeed, this is just a, sort of, this is work in progress. This is to show you what that model is capable of. So the same stuff, I'm pumping it at omega one and omega two. These are two plasmon resonances of that system. One of them is a localized plasmon and the other one is Bragg plasmon. And you can clearly see the second harmonics of each color. You can also see the difference frequency popping up here four wave mixing sitting right over here. You have a sum frequency and a bunch of other things um, going on. So this is really rich uh, toolbox that we can utilize. All right, so now let's take a look at something that uh, uh, Nien Uige measured in her lab in uh, UC Irvine. So the goal was to um, look at um, physical properties of second harmonic generated by uh, nanocrescents. So the nanocrescent is basically a literal crescent with a nano size, right? So we looked at the uh, gold nanocrescent on the order of about maybe 300 nanometers across and about, uh, I don't know, 50 or 80 nanometers uh, wide. Now, because this is non-center symmetric, of course, you have a very strong uh, uh, second uh, harmonic uh, signal. So a linear portion uh, is, is, is also pretty interesting. So if you are to shine light, which is paralyzed, uh, uh, polarized along X in this direction, you have the X bend, right? So this is, these are the electrons oscillating in this direction. If you are to probe the system polarized along Y, you exciting the Y bend. And of course, if the polarization of the light is somewhere in between, you see two bands, right? So this is what uh, you expect to see. And these are the experimental images. This is Nian Uige. She's currently stuck in Taiwan, by the way. She cannot leave uh, for almost a year now because of all these COVID restrictions and whatnot. Uh, so, so they consider two different types of uh, nanocrescents, the smaller ones and slightly larger ones. And these, this is the absorb absorbent spectra measured. So red color means that the light is polarized along longer axis and you see this nice band here and this is the shorter axis the blue band and so on now we did the simulations um, in linear regime and pretty nicely reproduced the, re, uh, the results from the experiment but the ultimate goal was to test our hydrodynamic model and uh, to see how we can describe uh, experiments on the second harmonic in these systems so uh, let me show you first the experimental results, and then I will show you the theory and explain uh, uh, what, we, what we learned from that. So this is the experimental data. So what we do is, what they do is the following. So you have the second harmonic generation, and then you launch the strong pump, and the pump is polarized along a particular uh, angle, which is measured in this direction here. So you basically rotate the sample like this, right? And then you measure the second harmonic signal polarized along X and second harmonic signal polarized along Y. So these are called uh, angular uh, uh, second harmonic generation diagrams. So, and then you vary the 
the pump frequency. Now, why is it important? Why is it interesting? If you are to assume that non-accrescent in the far field is basically a, a pointwise dipole, of course, from this type of diagrams, we can see which components of the second order susceptibility tensor contribute uh, to a particular, uh, at the particular wavelength, for example. Now, let's say I pump the system at this wavelength corresponding to the red uh, 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 resonance, right? So if I'm pumping the system at the red wavelength right over here, then my plasmon is the Y plasmon, which means that psi X, Y, Y should be the strongest. And that's exactly what they see for X polarization. So this is X polarization and this is theta. So sine square theta is maximum along 90 degrees, 270 degrees. You can clearly see that this is indeed the case. Now, the, the Y polarization of the second harmonic, this portion is also very important because it has the um, sine two theta dependence. So it has a four lobe structure, okay? So very nice, very nice diagram. So let's see what uh, simulations uh, give us. So I do exactly the same exercise, but of course in experiments, uh, you slightly limited by which wavelength you can use to pump. In, in, in theory, this is just a number in the big code. So what we did was to run a couple of simulations. So look at this diagram right over here. So I'm pumping the system at that red plasmon mode. And of course I see that sine square dependence as, as experimentally uh, they seem, right? And you have a full lobe structure here. Now, what if I pump my system at um, about 815, which corresponds to the blue mode right over here. So this means that this susceptibility uh, uh, tensor component is the highest. So you have the cosine square dependence. That's exactly what we see here. Now, if you pump right in between, right over here, you have the contribution of both triple uh, X and X, Y, Y. And that's exactly what we see here. So uh, sine square and cosine square both show up. The important thing to realize is that we have this four lobe pattern, which is very symmetric, okay? Now, uh, it's all cool. The problem is, if you look at closely, you see that in experiments, they see very big asymmetry. In, in theory, we don't see that. And the question was to understand where that asymmetry is coming from. So we realize that if we do simulations and the way we simulate crescent is basically superimposing two circles, one on top of the other, making that with a particular thickness as experiments, right? No matter how you put these two circles, one with respect to the other, you always get symmetric shape, always. Now, uh, since you have the asymmetry, this means that there is something wrong with the symmetric shape of non-accrescent, which means in reality in, in their experiments, there is no perfect symmetry. So in order to simulate no perfect symmetry, we superimpose ellipsoid on uh, ellipse on, on the circle, breaking the symmetry slightly. And we also threw some um, random pixels on the surface just to see what happens. So making crescent non-symmetric uh, leads to the following. So this is, this is the angular diagram we just saw a couple of seconds ago where everything is super symmetric. Now what I'm doing is I'm changing the symmetry of the system, which means that the upper portion is thinner than the, the lower one, for example. Um, so first of all, we see that diagram slightly rotates, right? Because the crescent is no longer perfectly vertical. And the second, the good news is that this four lobe structure is no longer perfectly symmetric. So number one. Number two, if you want to throw randomly a bunch of pixels, on top and the bottom, making sure that symmetric crescent is no longer symmetric, we can achieve uh, non-symmetry in the four lobe structure as well. Now, of course, if you throw five uh, uh, pixels, nothing changes, right? So you have to have significant number of pixels. And we found that it's on the order of a thousand pixels distributed randomly on the surface so leads to this non-symmetry. That's exactly what they see in experiment. So let me. Um, so this is the the first this first work I wanted to share uh, results um, off with you, and the final uh, thing that I want to talk about is to combine the hydrodynamic model that uh, is is pretty nice as as we can see with uh, Maxwell Bloch equations to see how this affects the nonlinear properties of strongly coupled systems. 
So the second harmonic generation strongly coupled system. So we did a couple of works uh, theoretically before uh, we were able to do some um, uh, collaboration with experiments and I'm gonna show you in a couple of seconds. So the idea is you have two coupled oscillators, right? So one of them is a plasma one and the other one are my molecules. Now in the coupled oscillator model, we know everything about that, right? But what if one of the oscillators has a non-linearity, but the second oscillator has no non-linearity second order. So this is basically two level system that cannot lead to even harmonic generation. So what would happen to the second harmonic, which is purely generated by let's say metal, if you have a bunch of two level systems that by themselves cannot generate the second uh, um, um, uh, harmonic. So you can analytically show that due to this coupling, you actually see the strong effect of molecules on the second harmonic uh, uh, signal. And in one of the works that we recently published, we show that if you are to consider this periodic array of triangular holes, as we discussed uh, a few uh, minutes ago, uh, you put the molecules inside that PVA layer and make them resonant to one of the plasmon resonances. But again, each molecule is a two level system. And then you uh, pump that system at the resonance and see what happens to the second harmonic. So this is the zoom in of the power spectrum at the second harmonic. Two colors correspond to two different number densities of molecules. So you can see how nicely they alter the second harmonic signal. Moreover, you can actually see the second uh, uh, harmonics of lower polariton and upper polariton along with the plasma one as well. Okay, so Experimentally, that is, a, of course, challenging, but uh, Haik Arutunyan at Emory uh, uh, managed to do really nice experiments. So uh, as all theoreticians, I'm uh, pretty oblivious in the experimental details, so pardon uh, some ignorant uh, statements that I may make okay, in terms of experiments. So what we considered was um, um, single gold nanorods on the size of about 150, 200 nanometers wide and with a radius of about maybe uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 nanometers uh, placed on top of a two-dimensional material. In this case was the tungsten deselenite. So the tungsten deselenite has a really nice resonance around um, 740 something nanometers, which corresponds to the exciton mode. of. So basically this 2D material is a gigantic two-dimensional uh, two uh, dipole. So we wanted to see the strong coupling in the second harmonic, uh, as, as I just described a minute ago. So these, uh, we did, they did the dark field measurement. So basically uh, the graduate student with the microscope was going from one hotspot to another, measured the uh, reflection and transmission spectra. So this is the linear spectra and you see the strong coupling popping up. So if you don't have the, to the material, this will be just a Lorentzian corresponding to the longitudinal plasmon of the single nanorod. Now, if you do the second harmonic generation, you do the same stuff locally. And if you have a single wire, you have a nice, really nice signal that you can detect. Now you throw this um, wire on top of 2D material and see what happens at the strong coupling regime to the second harmonic. So the, the results are here. On the left side, you have experiments and two different uh, spots. Uh, this is the second harmonic signal as a function of the pump frequency. So you see the splitting as we discussed. So each mode here is the second harmonic of the uh, upper and lower polaritonic states. So in our simulations, we uh, simulated the 2D material uh, coupled with uh, nanorod where we used the hydrodynamic model. And again, this is the second harmonic signal as a function of pump frequency. The black line it shows a single rod, which actually has two peaks. This peak corresponds to the generation of the second harmonic by the end of the rod. If you are to turn on uh, uh, that flake of 2D material, you see the splitting right over here. And we can also add the second order susceptibility to the tungsten deselenite, which is pretty small actually. And it turns out that um, even though it's present, the, uh, the ultimate um, um, the conclusion from this uh, is that you do see the second harmonic from both uh, lower and upper polaritonic states. So this was just recently accepted in nanoletters. And I'm actually done. So uh, 
conclusion is we talk about the present, uh, we talk about the exciton plus muon material model and expanded to the nonlinear optical response of metal nanostructures, including molecules. We looked at the second harmonic signals generated by nanocrescents compared with experiments and also did the comparison with experiment on exciton plus muon systems in, uh, 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 with a nanowire scaffold to uh, 2D mm -hmm. material. And that's it. So I think I should not, uh, I should uh, go back to sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please leave it because I expect some questions. Is yeah. I have some of them, but let uh, let us first check. Maybe in our audience, we also have some questions. Dear colleagues, uh, the talk is open for discussions, and thank you very much, Maxim, for very interesting this uh, presentation. My pleasure.